Welcome back, Justin. Rich, thanks for having me again, man. Well, hopefully this time it'll be better than last time. Man, we we had all kinds of problems. My audio was like not hooked up. So it was this, <laughs> my camera was reading the, the sound, the dogs were barking. You know, you had terrible Wi-Fi. Whew. What a mess. Yeah. Yeah. If it could Pepper just heard me sigh and came over here to comfort me. <laughs> She's good a good girl. She is a good girl. That's my that's my German Shepherd dog. If nobody's if, if anybody on here doesn't know, Pepper's a sweetheart. Your new oh, Will Woods is joining us. Says good afternoon, Rich and Justin from Missouri. Coin number twenty two sixty nine. Will Parker at Montana says glad I didn't miss this morning. He slept in. Well, <laughs> glad to have you. Will just drove like sixteen hundred miles on his motorcycle. Man, man, that's a trip. I tell you, it is. Especially, I'm actually reading Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance right now, and it's kind of, I don't think I'm going to buy a motorcycle, but it, it, it's interesting. It is interesting. Uh, yeah, I read that years ago, probably 10 years ago, and it's, I don't know if I love it or, or what, but it's interesting, and it, I think it holds the distinction of being rejected the most for any bestseller. Really? Does that sound right? And it is, yeah. it is a popular book, too. Yeah, it is. I don't think I've ever talked to anybody that hasn't heard of that. That's correct. How about this? Have they heard of this, Justin? The American Everybody's heard of that. Your AWS coin. That's right. Uh, so if you want to find out if becoming a coin member of our self-defense, self-preservation community is the right decision for you and your family, you want to get inside the training vault and find out what all the cool kids are up to in there, you're going to have to take a free 14-day test drive on Mr. Mike Seeklander and I. We got new branded shirts that should be delivered. I'm hoping they were shipped yesterday. Uh, we're going to bring back the classic. You can have it in any color you want as long as it's black. Uh, you're welcome, America. We did it. Um, Will says, I love my coin. Mr. Parker says, second day was filled with snow, rain, and freezing temps. Better you than me, my friend. My hat's off to you, sir. Yeah. When we were in Montana recently, Will Parker drove down from uh, his place up near Kalispell all the way down to Missoula for hours just to have lunch with us. That's a kind of committed friend. That's he is. awesome. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Will says, I'm excited for the black. Yeah, man. I uh, can't wait. As soon as I get them in my hot little hands and they meet with mine and Mike's approval, we're going to be uh, taking orders for those. So what's, Speaking the, of what's the new shirt? Huh? What What, what is it? It's going to be the classic AWS. We're bringing oh, back the yeah, old man. classic from 10 years ago. Dude, mine's got holes all in it from where my gun's worn holes in it. They're amazing shirts. And uh, so hopefully if these meet to the same quality standards as the, the first run we did of several thousand, we're going to do a massive order. We're going to do the black classic hoodie this time, as well as the black classic shirt. Yeah, bro. If it ain't broke. I agree. Speaking of it ain't broke, don't fix it. If you want to read. <laughs> testosterone level you run chase mama around the house this is the book you're going to need Laws <laughs> of action uncensored by your old pal rich brown uh if you take a take a backstage pass to some of the stupid shit i was into in my 20s and click the links in today's show notes go to the richbrown.com buy it buy a book and i'll ship it out there to you uh will says that book is amazing well thank you sir you're obviously a discerning uh, person of literary taste. Derek is on from North Carolina. Will says, I'm wearing one of my AWS shirts today. Well, glad to have you, my brother. Like and hit that share button. I'm going to go ahead and read Justin's amazing bio. Justin's probably no stranger to many of you. Justin has been my very good friend now for almost a decade. Justin is a former reconnaissance, force reconnaissance, and martial arts operator with tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as the Philippines. He was also a former OGA contractor with many deployment to Central Asia. After his time in the Marine Corps and OGA, Justin was contracted as a special operations instructor for the United States military. Justin is a published author of six books, dozens of online and print magazine articles, and his amazing blog, Swift, Silent, and Deadly. And I want him to tell us more about that. I'm a huge, huge fan of what he is doing. He has traveled the world with 28 countries and 44 of the 50 states under his belt. He has also been a podcaster co-hosting the popular, amazing show with your old pal, Rich Brown, called Across the Peak. It's still available out there on iTunes if you want to check it out. Uh, is currently serving as a practicing paramedic and search and rescue team member. Justin, welcome back. Rich, thanks for having me, man. 
Yeah, I'm we, gonna visit some more countries and states, man. I'm tired. Like I, I'm tired of the same number every time. Yeah. Uh, what is Will Park says? I read Rich, <laughs> Rich's book and got my menopausal 62 year old wife pregnant. I read Rich's <laughs> book and got my brother pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> that should be a warning label on there. You know what I mean? I mean seriously. Yeah. Yeah. It should make be a cause like this, like make may cause you to, to get regular farm animals uh, impregnated or something. I don't know. What, what what's it the thing when you're wearing like the testosterone? deodorant you're not supposed to be around you're not supposed to be around certain people or whatever that's right yeah, this thing's just hard. yeah this thing make you toxic <laughs> zach says coin number 2548 joining from oklahoma glad to have you guys <clears throat> please hit the share button uh justin man so what have you been up to since we talked last uh recap what we talked about i don't know if anybody heard anything we said on the last show a super heavy training year i've done three uh, mountain search and rescue classes, uh, awareness operations and technician. So I'm a mountain search and rescue technician now. Um, you and I went to, uh, met you, picked you up on the way out to somewhere in the middle of God knows where Tennessee to do a Dusty Solomon class. Uh, I got a green ops carbine class coming up in Virginia. I, well, I guess technically next month, mid April. Um, got another, uh, rescue class coming up, a shotgun class this summer. It's, Laying it on hot and heavy with the training this year, uh, and hopefully substitute a little bit of that for some travel and a vacation next year. But yeah, that's the priority right now, man. Yeah, um, that Dusty Solomon class is pretty awesome. Are you going to go to that other class we got invited to in June? I can't go to the one in June because I have two other competing. Uh, I, I, I'm just overbooked in June. I'd love to go to. He, he told me. Um, if I can't make the one in June, let him know and he'll send me an invite to another one. So yeah, I, I, me and Mike are going to the one in June. So if you can in any way clear your <laughs> schedule, it'd be, it'd be awesome to put the band back together. What is, do you know the dates off that right off the top of your head? I do not. Ugh. Yeah. He told me you might attend, but that was quite a ways ago. I'm sorry. I'm being vague about it. I'm being, I'm being purposely vague for a reason. Yeah, I would tell yeah. you uh, if, if he, gives us permission to put it out there. I'll put it out there and maybe more AWS members it's a, can join us. It's an instructor's first class and I have a feeling he's going to be uh, very well respected right out of the gate. Um, yeah, very. Just based on some of his background and stuff. Yeah, exactly. So stay tuned. Perhaps you'll hear more about that. Oh, look, Ruben is on. It's my favorite podcast. Glad to have you on board, Ruben. The handsome man right there. And one of the best instructors I've ever had the privilege of, of being around. Uh, check out uh, it's at the Amador group and Ruben, if you don't mind, go ahead and throw your link to your, your training company on there. Uh, fantastic folks. I'd love to train with you sometime. Um, so we talked about that. Uh, you talked about lots of upcoming, I mean, training that you're doing. You have really gotten into the shotgun hot and heavy recently, haven't you? I have, um, I, I just been doing some work on my own. I'm going to uh Semtex, uh, shotgun course, I think in Ohio in June. Uh, that's one of my, one of my things I'm really looking forward to in June. Um, and just been doing a lot of stuff on my own and, um, pretty, pretty decent with a shotgun. Um, if I, if I can speak frankly. Yes, you are. Um, and, and I think the reason I wanted to, to do that, it's almost like kind of the accountability piece you and I used to do when we had across the people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like what have you been doing this week? And, and if you, if when you and I were doing the show, you know, knowing that you're going to ask me and I'm going to have to tell the truth to our audience. <laughs> it ain't like, well, I'll just lay yeah. on my ass here at the farm. Nah, that's okay. <laughs> I got to get in a range, at least one or two range sessions. I'm going to have to go to jujitsu. Right. I'm going to have to go to the gym. Uh, and I think that men probably need that accountability piece. I mean, you could certainly, as one of the Marsoc plank owners, a force reconnaissance Marine, done some contracting overseas with a three letter agency. You could easily go, yeah. <sighs> I got my cool guy resume. I'm going to sit on my ass. And one of the things I've always loved and respected about you is you've never taken that approach. Well, the, the firearm stuff I should probably scale back on. Honestly, I'm doing a, a lot of firearms training this year. Um, I should probably cut back on it a little bit. Um, I, <laughs> if I could be known as anything, I think I'd want to be known as the guy with the most well-rounded training resume, uh, out there. And I've, I've, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've told you this before, but, you know, kind of like, why, why are you going to be a paramedic? It's like, well, you join the military. If you want to, you know, if you want to be a guy that is, is a gun, you know, a, a gun guy for lack of a better term, like go work in a profession of arms for a little while. If you want to be good at tactical medicine, don't take a fucking class 
do it for a living for a little while, do, like do the thing um, and actually do it. Uh, and that's, that's kind of always been my philosophy on this stuff. Uh, you know, I haven't done everything uh, that I talk about or that I've been to training on as for a living, but um, I like, that's, that's kind of my goal is to be the, the dude with the most well-rounded training resume out there. I, you know, I haven't trained with every cool guy firearms instructor out there, but uh, I've done a bunch of different stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You have, um, you know what? I know we're, today's show is going to be on non-permissive environments and that's, that's where we're going to, that's where we're heading with this. But before we get into that, you have attended, and I think you alluded to this part of your training from last year is mountain s survival. Mm -hmm. You went to two really, really good schools. Can you tell us any about what you learned in those schools? Oh man. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like basically if you, if you, one, you gotta, you gotta practice these skills. Everybody thinks they know how to build a fire, um, know how to build a shelter, know how to find water, whatever you have to practice this stuff and you need to be trained on how to do it. Um, I got, uh, you know, I, in 2023, I went to Randall's adventure trainings, field survival, which is an absolute gut check. It's three days of no sleep, no food. Um, getting yourself PT'd into the dirt um, and and still having to go out and perform, you know, do land nav to a very high degree of accuracy and, you know, perform all these survival skills. Uh, and they, you know, they say we can't put you in a plane crash, but we can do this to stress you out. And they do a really good job of it. Uh, then I went to uh, the basic survival course at the Pathfinder School up in Ohio, Dave Canterbury School, uh, learned a lot from that. And then got into the mountain search and rescue class in January. And I was like, ah, I got this down. I'm good. And absolutely got humbled building a fire after it had been raining for about three days. And it was about uh, 15 degrees outside. And I really, really needed to get a fire. So you have to practice these skills, man. That was my biggest takeaway is, is don't get cocky. Don't assume you know how to do this stuff uh, just because you've done it before. Uh, all these skills that we talk about from firearms to combatives to, you know, knife stuff to high performance driving, whatever. It needs to be practiced. It needs to be refreshed. Uh, and probably above all, it needs to be trained. Yeah, I agreed. I hundred percent agreed. And you know, you, you, you not just learn, but you learn what equipment work. You might think this is a sweet piece of kit and this is my, this yeah. thing's the cat's me out and you take it out, then the straps break on it the first time. <laughs> or is this ugly, unloved piece of kit might be like this damn thing just works. Yeah. I don't know why, you know, you know, like fire starting stuff, uh, since you're on that, I've seen people bring out every, commercial fire starter under the sun, the little, you know, Coglin's fire paste, the, um, you know, little makeup pad things, the, I don't know, sawdust looking stuff, all kinds of stuff. Nothing works as good as cotton balls soaked in Vaseline. Like nothing works as good as that. I don't know why everybody tr keeps trying to reinvent the wheel, but uh, I gave away probably 10 times more of those than I actually use. Cause everybody needed help getting a fire going. Those things. Would you say cotton balls and Vaseline? Mm hmm. I tell you, yeah, that, that is the shit. Yeah. And it costs next to nothing. I know, and it weighs next to nothing. And you can, you can throw and, twenty of them into yeah. a into a little ziploc bag like I do, and it weighs and nothing. And I was, I, I I tried to avoid it for the longest time because I'm like, ah, this is some old man lame -o technique, but it's cliche for a reason, man. Amen. Uh, Tony says two in one day. Uh, I'm not sure what that question is. Remember the ten C's? Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Yeah, we could do. I, if we have talking about Dave Canterbury's 10 seasons survival there. Yeah. 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 So we should, we should, we, hell, we could do a whole show on that one if you want to. Yeah, for sure. That'd be pretty cool. Uh, so like I told you on the last show that we had the abortive attempt, we tried to do a week <laughs> or so ago. I wanted to talk about what books are you currently reading? My friend. Um, uh, I can't, can't recommend on violence of bridles. Yeah. Heavily enough there, my friend. Um, I'm going to give you a fun one and a serious one. Uh, Heads and Beds by Jacob Tomsky. Probably the funnest is the first book I read this year and probably the funnest one. It was a guy who worked at a really upscale hotel in New York City for many years and just all the crazy stories, all the crazy behind the scenes. Um, just a fascinating look at that world of, uh, he calls it so-called hospitality. Um, the serious one, Spotting Danger Before It Spots You by Gary Quisenberry. Quisenberry. Uh, former uh, retired federal air marshal after 25 years in the air. Um, it, kind of a cheesy title. Uh, it was recommended to me by my good friend, Neil. And man, who is a pilot, actually. It is a phenomenally good book on situational awareness. Uh, can't recommend that highly enough if you have not read it. Another one you were talking about recently is Militia House. I thought the premise <laughs> of that sounded pretty freaking awesome. Yeah. Did have you, you read that it? yet? 
I, I have did, not, yeah. man. But I'm I, that's my next on my list, I think, unless you tell me otherwise. So I feel like horror books are always a little bit of a letdown at the end. So this is a military horror genre book. Uh, it's modern day Marines in Afghanistan. It's it's this very small detachment of what are they? LSB Marines, the landing support logistics right. guys uh, on a fob with a artillery battery. And uh, man, the guy just nails the lingo and the just the experience of being a Marine in that kind of environment. And then like to the point, he, he does such a good job that the the actual story almost takes backseat to just the the minutia of, uh, you know, all the little terminology and lingo and stuff Marines use and that, you know, kind of the attitudes toward, you know, pogues or combat arms guys or whatever. It <laughs> phenomenally good book, man. Also recommended to me by same, same buddy, Neil. Hmm. That's cool. Uh, what's it also, as far as our icebreaker question, this is something new I'm trying is if you could learn one skill overnight, you just wake up and there it is. Uh, what yeah. would that skill or skills be? Oh gosh. Um, I th well, I'm, I think this is one of the parts that actually got heard in the last episode. So, uh, if you're, if you're listening to this again, I'm, I apologize, but I, I, I think it would be, I think I'd flip a coin and take either one as it came, either play the violin or have a foreign language. Um, and not so much just because I guess I would want to actually go through the process of learning, uh, that violin, especially because it, it increases your, um, your hand-eye coordination or your coordination generally uh, because you're doing two different things with two different hands increases it like any musical instrument uh, improves your creativity, increases your cognitive ability, your memory. Um, I just think it's an awesome thing to know how to do. And also uh, like not everything we do has to be super serious, right? Like we can actually do right. some stuff just for kind of the, um, the therapeutic value, the entertainment value or whatever. Uh, but also knowing how to, I, I regret to say, I still don't know how to speak another language. No, nor do I. But to your point, though, as far as learning things that are kind of <clears throat> not everything needs to be combat arms related, I guess, is to your point. But I think, yeah, because some of these things just help you lead a richer, fuller life. You know, um, like when I was trying to learn to play the guitar, my lieutenant colonel was teaching me and he got us into a uh, I wouldn't say it was a blues band, just some country kind of a jug band. And we played in a couple of gigs, you know, and I got to meet people I would have never have <laughs> met before had I not got involved in that. You know what I mean? That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you to everyone watching us live. Mr. J is on from Hawaii is coin number 181. Will Rhodes says two shows in one day. That's right, guys. You are welcome. Gotcha. I, I had on Cecil Birch this morning. Yeah, Rich is dropping a deuce. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Not every day, but some days. Um, what are the, so let's get into the kind of the meat of the show. What I wanted to talk to you about as far as yeah, like yeah. operational environments. And I, I got the, the kernel of this idea came from once again, your major blog, swift, silent and deadly.com. If you're not following Justin there, there's a link in today's show notes. Please take advantage of it. He is putting out some amazing content, not just articles, and book reviews and things of this nature, but he's finally doing some really high quality reviews of shooting drills and guns and gear. Can't recommend it enough. But one of the articles you wrote recently, if I remember correctly, was one on uh, operational environments from permissive, semi permissive, non permissive, et cetera. So, what kind of operational environments do we operate in? Um, so I just want to be very clear right at the outset. Um, I do not carry <clears throat> a firearm at my work, um, but that's initially like it's, it's prohibited. I would lose my, uh, license to practice. I would lose my job. I, my, probably my ability to work in this field. Um, I just want to be really, really clear about that right up front. However, uh, kind of the, kind of the brain teaser piece of this of like, what, what would I do? Um, kind of sparked this idea. So I started uh, doing a lot of research on NPE carry or non-permissive environment carry. Um, obviously looking for, you know, what are the preferred um, preferred guns and holsters and that sort of thing for NPE carry. And what I found is there's not a lot of great information out there. There's not a lot of things that actually are applicable to a non-permissive environment as I kind of defined it. And the breakdown seems to be that everything from your mother-in-law kind of giving you a frown across the table if she sees your gun to you going to prison for 20 years falls under that NPE umbrella. And I, I, I think that's um, a, a gross misuse of the term. Uh, so these terms did not 
originate in the civilian concealed carry space. These originated uh, in the military and the intelligence community. And we basically have three types of operational environment, permissive, non permissive, semi-permissive and non-permissive. So uh, your permissive environment would be uh, if we want to put this in the context of the civilian concealed carrier, would be the United States with your either uh, constitutional carry or your concealed carry permit in your pocket. You can go pretty much wherever you want. Uh, most of the time, no one's going to hassle you. If your shirt blows up and somebody sees your gun, guess what? Non-issue because you've you know you got your permit, you're legal, you're constitutional, whatever it is. It's it's a non-issue. There's I call that the no stakes environment in the military. Um, that might be something like. Um, and by the way. Most of the time, in most places, the military don't carry guns around. Um, right. I, I know it's a shock to most people, but uh, military uh, a per, or intelligence community permissive environment might be, um, you know, Western Europe. Uh, you're walking around France. You're not carrying a, you know, unless you're in some really really special assignment, uh, you know, personal security detail or something like that. You're not carrying a gun, uh, but you can you can come and go as you please. No one really. You know, everybody probably just thinks you're a dumb American tourist. No one really looks twice at you. You're not detained at, a, you know, no risk of being searched or anything like that. You, know, um, you, you mentioned that most America, most Americans would be shocked to find out that most military dudes are not packing at all times. That, yeah, they, they are certainly not. <clears throat> no. uh, and if you are like when, like I've said before on the show, I'm almost 55 but, but when I was a 21 year old Marine, I was carrying a concealed Beretta M9 around Europe, I, I, you know, and didn't think a thing about it, whether I was in wearing my utility uniform or I was wearing civilian clothes because of the nature of the work I was doing at the time. I say that because when you're in those positions, you're under what's called a SOFA agreement, standard of forces agreement between us and that host nation. <clears throat> so again, if you're operating in that environment where there's a signed, sealed, and delivered SOFA agreement between the two governments, you're in a permissive environment, are you not? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, you know, a good example of that would be Okinawa, um, right. which is, you know, prefecture in Japan. Um, you, anytime you do have a gun, you go to the armory and you check it out and you do whatever, you know, unit training that you're doing and then you go check it back in and that's that. Um, if you, I mean, Japan grief if you um, illegally got caught with a gun out in town. It is a non-permissive environment in that sense, right? If you chose to, I don't know how you'd even get your hands on a gun in Japan, but if you... Yeah, you're operating outside the right, context right. of what you're allowed to do. But what's interesting is for most countries where there's a SOFA agreement, <clears throat> you are not going to be uh, locked up by that host nation. It doesn't always work. Sometimes that government may want you really bad and you're and the government's going to let your ass fry uh depending on what the what the uh, violation is but you know what the marine corps is not going to do not going to give you a big pat on the back and a handshake and be like we got we'll take care of you there sergeant brown not a chance uh, marine corps you're gonna gonna do you upright uh yeah, so, so that, from that's this our, no stakes environment yeah that, that's what i call the no stakes environment there's there's essentially no meaningful impact to your life at all might be a you know the slightest of inconveniences to you of uh, or even I don't know. Very slight inconvenience to you. No stakes, no lasting impact to, to the quality of your life. Uh, so then let's jump to the non-permissive environment. Then we'll, we'll come back and fill in the semi-permissive. So the non-permissive environment would be a place uh, in civilian context uh, like New York City. Uh, if you don't have a concealed carry permit in New York City, which as I, I I've never held one in New York City, uh, I understand they're very hard to get. You basically have to be rich. Um, and if you get caught, you're probably going to be charged with a felony and you're probably going to have either spend a fortune getting out of it, or you're probably going to probably going to do a little time in the, in the stony lonesome. You know what I'm saying? Hey, yeah. Yeah. So, so um, that's a non-permissive. Yeah. This is what high I call stakes. the high stakes environment. Right. Yeah. And the way I define this is, it, and it doesn't have to be jail, but there are lasting uh, consequences for that action if you get caught. So uh, freedom is, I don't think anyone would argue with me, one of the greatest things about this country. I care deeply about my freedom. So um, I, I'm not going to be reckless in carrying a gun in a non-permissive environment and say, screw it, like let them throw me in jail. No, I do not want to go to jail. Um, like I'm carrying that gun to protect myself against uh, rapists and murderers and you know 
people who commit armed robbery and that sort of thing. I don't want to be in jail with those people. Cause if I do go to jail with those people, guess who's going to have weapons then and who's not, uh, I'm not going to be the guy that knows how to get away with carrying around a sharpened toothbrush, uh, in my prison wallet. Right. Um, <laughs> I, I don't want to go to jail. I do not want to forfeit my freedom. I don't want to be locked up with the very people that I want to avoid contact with in the first place. Um, jail is just one consequence. It could be the loss of your job. Uh, really easy to say, uh, I can, I can always get a new job. Uh, not easy to do it. It's, it's <laughs> the job market. Um, job market's pretty tough. And most of the people watching this, I imagine are pretty stable in their career. I don't imagine there's a lot of uh, people hopping around from job to job. Uh, but the type of people that hop around from job to job probably aren't in super high income fields, probably, um, uh, you know, probably kind of at the mercy of the market of taking whatever they can get. Um, if you're, you know, if you're making 80 grand a year and you get fired for carrying a gun and now you have to tell every future employee, uh, why you left your old job, it's going to be hard to get another job. And that's, you've got people depending on you. Right. And, you know, back to the getting locked up thing, right. I've, you know, if you have a wife, kids, uh, you're locked up, who's taking care of them. That's, that's the other aspect of that. So, um, that is the non-permissive environment, the very high stakes, uh, you're going to lose income. You're going to go to jail and now have a criminal record. Uh, you're going to maybe lose the ability to carry a firearm going forward legally. Um, that is what I call the high stakes environment. A lot of, a lot of potentially very bad outcomes, uh, from getting caught in that environment. And let's talk about this because it's not just, we're not just talking about the gun guys, you know, as everyone knows, I just returned from Scotland a couple uh, maybe a month or so ago. And I had to fly into Paris in order to get there. And I flew with my armored backpack. So I had a backpack with a ballistic panel in it. And I had, you know, my uh, pretty sexy flashlight, but really that's about it. <clears throat> uh, you know, and I thought, okay, we're going to find out whether this flashlight's going to freak anybody out at the at Charles de Gaulle. And it didn't scare anybody in Paris. They handed it right to me. And the same thing with the backpack when I went through the London airport uh, and the slights. <clears throat> but again, I, I wasn't rolling around with a G17 because if I did, I'm looking at 10 freaking years. Easy. <laughs> in in a France man prison. Exactly. <laughs> uh, same thing with the, with the blade. So it's, it's contextual and that's, part of the nuanced conversation that I think is missing in this discussion of NPE environments. So we talked about no stakes and we talked about high stakes, Justin, what else is there? Uh, so then there's the semi-permissive environment, which is the uh, stakes. There's, there's some kind of stakes in that environment. Right. Um, and they may be, uh, they're probably not going to alter your life permanently, but they may be an inconvenience and um, you know, Maybe a maybe a misdemeanor charge, maybe. Uh, although you can still go to jail for a misdemeanor. I don't want to. I don't want a misdemeanor firearms charge on my record. Uh, but there, uh, things like uh, a shopping mall that has a sign that says um, "No firearms allowed," that does not have the force of law behind it. So the state says, "Yeah, you can say there's. You can say you don't allow firearms. Uh, that's your right to do on your property, but." We're not going to, there's no criminal charge for that. If somebody gets caught, they, you can ask them to leave, but that's it. That would be a semi-permissive environment. Yeah. It's, it, there's going to be some inconvenience, some embarrassment, some, you know, a little bit of a very mild charitable, but again, this is not life altering, uh, stakes. And, and I think that's really what's missing, uh, from this conversation. I, you know, in, in a lot of research of NPE carry, <laughs> You know, I, I mentioned it in the article. I specifically ran across an article and said, all right, what do you guys carry for NPE? And specifically not where it's illegal to carry. And it's like, well, if that's not an NPE, what is like that? You know, if we're just calling everything an NPE, then then nothing is. It's a meaningless term. It could be something like uh, your, your pastor frowns upon it. And then maybe it's in the bylaws that you can't carry a gun at a church. Well, they're not going to arrest you for it, but you're also not going to be a part of the congregation come Monday morning. So Right. You lose some sort of social standing, lose some yes. sort of, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, you, you carry at your Thanksgiving at your crazy leftist aunt's house and, and you know, it's going to create a giant rift in the family, but nobody's going to jail over it. Nobody's losing their job, but there's a social stigma. Uh, there's loss of friendship. I think those are also important. And again, we're not just talking about the gun, guys. It could be anything. Pepper spray so, in the UK so real, will get you real 10 quick. years. Yeah. I real quick, Rich, I've heard you say that the gun is just a tool and I absolutely yeah. subscribe to that. Right. Um, a carpenter, 
uh, doesn't just have one way to measure a, a piece of lumber, right? The gun is just a tool. So I didn't put anything special on for this, but um, I have the gun. I have, you know, moving to my like second line, I have, I carry a big can of prepper spray on me all the time. Um, I also have a small thing of pepper spray on me uh, all the time. If I have to leave my, uh, you know, my big can behind because of my clothing choices or whatever, this is pretty much always on me. Uh, I've got a flashlight, which is also an impact weapon. Um, and then I've got myself, right? I'm not helpless. Uh, I'm, right. I'm toothless and clawless, but I assure you I'm, I'm not helpless. And um, I, I'm not going to be a victim. Um, you may have the yeah. upper hand on me, but I promise you it's not going to be easy. Absolutely, man. And I have carried maybe not a firearm, but definitely like pepper spray when I wasn't supposed to, or a plastic knife by TDI. They make a great one called the shark bite. You know, uh, it's a little plastic push dagger. There's some other things I've carried into concert venues and I've kind of, I question it, you know, it doesn't have the, the stigma of law, but I'm never going to get to go to the Rhineman again, for example, not that I've carried in the Rhineman, let's just say, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, that's a semi-permissive environment. I'm not going to go to jail, but I may lose the ability to go to that concert venue. But then you see something like what happened in Moscow recently, 137 dead or whatever the death toll finally ends up right. being. And uh, it, it makes you say, you know, you start running the calculus, whether yeah. this is an appropriate thing or not. And also, yeah, I also forgot to mention, but always have a blade on me. Yeah. Um, yeah so, I mean, the, the, the gun is just one tool and, and, you know, like you said, in some places, um, you know, pepper spray may specifically be prohibited, but a knife may fly under the radar. Um, and, you know, I can think, I can, like, my work environment, pepper spray is specifically prohibited. Um, but this is classified as a rescue tool. So um, this is not prohibited. Um, That's an interesting it, distinction, is it not? <clears throat> Uh, well, I mean, there's nothing, not, not for you. There's not, nothing not, that says the, the yeah. purple spider co paramilitary tool is a rescue tool. I say this is a rescue tool, right? This is a seatbelt cutter. Um, well, what I'm getting at is like I've said, you know, when you arrive in the UK, the giant sign that you have to walk in front of when you get off the airplane, it says, if you're, if you're carrying any of these offensive weapons, <laughs> you got to go and surrender them immediately or you'll be prosecuted, thrown right. to prison, et cetera. And there's everything you can think of. There's like 30 different st you, stupid you, tools You didn't take a there. picture of that by chance, did you? I did. Uh, I'd love to enough. see it sometime. I'll have to find it on the phone while you're chatting here in a minute. But the point of saying that is the use of the tool decides whether it's offensive or defensive. It's not the tool itself. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. But but some reason. I mean, as, as we know, a, a box truck can be an offensive weapon precisely and i make that distinction because if if an entire country can't even see the logical fallacy that they're creating there by going no these are always offensive all the time right i don't think they are right. <laughs> but anyway how do we i mentioned calculus a moment ago justin how do we sort through that calculus as to are we going to carry in an npe and if so what are we going to carry and measure and uh those stakes um, so that really depends on, you know, risk benefit analysis, right. Or cost benefit analysis. Um, in the firearms community, we love to say it's not the odds, it's the stakes, uh, when in fact it's both, we, sh we should actually be considering both. Um, there is a, a very, very small, but very real likelihood that a meteor could strike your house, but we don't all build meteor proof houses, right? Um, it, because of the odds, the stakes are devastating potentially, but the odds are so small that we're able to weigh those odds and it, and it just doesn't make sense financially, right? It costs a fortune to, you know, tunnel your house, however far underground, whatever. Um, so we have to weigh the, the odds, uh, and crime is not distributed equally, uh, either in place or in population. Um, crime is very often perpetrated against other criminals. That's very much what I see. Uh, in my environment. And I think inner city environment, that's typically what we'd see as well. Anything can happen anywhere to anybody. I'm not saying uh, you're, you're perfectly safe anywhere at any time with any group of people in any environment. Uh, there's always a, a chance, but it's being able to, to estimate that risk accurately. Uh, and Rich, I sent you an article uh, that we should make sure we get in the show notes by Bruce Schneier that talks about how poor we are as 
people at estimating risk. We tend to overestimate fantastical risks uh, like plane crashes, uh, but none of us really get stressed out about driving down the road, even though you are many thousands of times more likely to be killed driving down the road. Uh, we tend to overestimate things that are intentional uh, versus things that are accidental. Uh, none of us really worries too much about dying from the flu, even though it kills tens of thousands of people a year. But at the same time, like collectively, we panic every Halloween about people putting razor blades in candy, even though there's not one single documented case of that happening because one is an act of nature and one's intentional. Um, right. We, uh, I, you know, back to the, we tend to overestimate things that are, um, uh, that make the news basically and underestimate things that are mundane. We like, we should absolutely be terrified of cancer and take, you know, take, you know, not like quit smoking, quit dipping, uh, you know, moderate the drinking way back, that sort of thing. Um, well, it's like OSHA brother, you know, OSHA puts out a quarterly report every single year. And I think for the last probably forever, it's always been falls over six feet. Yeah. Slips, trips and falls. Yeah. It's I'm telling you, man, a, a fall at six feet kills more people every year I mean, yeah. in the workplace. It's crazy. So real quick, here's that, um, that thing. It is illegal. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, I see that it's not a focus area. enough to read, but man, that is a long list of stuff. It is illegal to bring. Uh, I can see the on, graphic has an AK 47, a brass knuckles, <laughs> a Glock. Yeah. It's just an insane long list here. Stealth stuff knives. Yeah. Yeah. Rocks that are sharp on one end. And this is <laughs> ridiculous. Uh, Tony newspaper. says like being on a bridge that gets hit by a boat. <laughs> That may or may not have been targeted cyber attack. Just saying. Yeah. So um, I think you, your, your point is incredibly well made and well taken. We do overestimate these, these uh, catastrophic risks. My brother, you know, when we were, who was I? Yeah. I was flying with my brother recently, went to New Mexico and he was kind of nervous. I said, man, I haven't flown in a long time. The last time I flew was on when he was with a certain team in the military, they flew almost always charter aircraft. And he's like, this is the first time I've flown with the, the rank and file idiots in a yeah. long time. <laughs> and I said, yeah, man, but I, you're safer here than you are in your own freaking bed. I mean, statistically it's the safest place in the world. Probably has been on a commercial aircraft in, in the United States. So, and that's another great example of a non-permissive environment. Do the, mm -hmm. does the risk warrant trying to smuggle a weapon into that environment versus the cost of being caught? Uh, like is the risk high enough to warrant trying to do it? Uh, does it make that risk of being, cause you almost certainly be caught and uh, you know, runs the gamut from missing your flight to being on a no fly list for the rest of your life to, you know, facing some sort of felony charges. If you, you know, kind of runs again, you, I, I'm sure you could probably, well, that was, a, that was so many cases of people forgetting guns in their briefcases or whatever. I'm sure you could probably talk your way out of it, but, uh, you're still going to miss yeah, a but, flight. Well, I mean, and you and I've traveled through a lot of foreign airports and that's the ones I'm worried about. I'm not really say worried about TSA here. I think that could easily be handled, uh, outside of court, you know, with some sort of judicial <clears throat> diversion, like, all right, look, I, you know, this is the guy's background. It's an honest mistake, but yeah, I, I don't, yeah. I'll be honest. I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to deal with it either, but you know, I, if I forget something in my thing, but I mean, like when I, I didn't know how this was going to be looked at in France. Right. I don't know if I was going to be pulled aside. I had read the laws in the UK and I had read the laws to say it was okay to have an armored backpack with a ballistic panel, but it was like, it had to meet some sort of uh UK specific approval and have, have their certification on it. Well, I knew it Can't didn't have any sharp edges or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, you know, I mean, so I was taking a little bit of a risk with that ballistic panel. I'm like, what are they going to make me do? Cut it up? Are they going to detain me? I mean, right. Um, so, again, all that all that stuff needs to be thought ahead before you go. Right. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, like, we've talked about risk quite a bit and trying to estimate that risk. Um, the other factor would be, um, you know, the necessity so or the, the, the benefit, right? Uh, are, you, are you at enough risk actually? Uh, that warrants trying to, that warrants taking that risk. Uh, and again, I want to be very, very clear that I would never carry a firearm where I work. Um, but in doing this, in doing this calculus, um, I could almost make a case for it, right? Uh, I'm a full-time paramedic. Paramedics are like 25% higher risk of assaults 
then the general population at large, um, numerous cases of paramedics being, you know, severely injured on the job. We have, well, until recently we had a guy working here who lost a testicle because of, you know, patient, like we deal with combative people, whether they are, um, you know, coming from the jail, they're high on meth or they've had a stroke and, or have low blood sugar and don't know what they're doing or they've had a seizure. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, that gets into a whole other topic of, you know, when does that person stop, cease being a patient and become an assailant? But, and that's probably a good topic for uh, you to hash out with Walt Settlemeyer at some point, yeah. uh, our mutual friend, Walt. Uh, but, um, y- you know, what's the actual risk? Like, do you, do you work in a white collar office in a nice section of town and, you know, drive a very, you know, a very safe route to your, you know, gated white collar neighborhood or, you know, are you, are you working three jobs at three different fast food places all hours of the day in the bad part of town? Cause that's the only jobs you can get and you got mouths to feed and you don't really have a choice. Uh, Maybe a little bit different calculus, right? Also what's, you know, if you get fired from your fast food job, you're going to be able to find another one. Probably so. If you get fired from your, uh, you know, your surgeon position at, at, you know, at, at whatever hospital you are making $400,000 a year, are you going to be able to get hired again? Are you going to, you know, what, what, what actually is the cause? If you're a nurse um, at a hospital and you get caught fired um, and that, you know, you may not work as a nurse ever again. And that's, that's a pretty significant loss of income, but you know, also what's the risk or or will you actually be like, what is your employer's policy? There's a lot of stuff that goes into uh, what, what is your environment actually? Is it actually non-permissive or is it semi-permissive? And that is another huge factor in in making a determination on whether you should try to carry or not. It it certainly does. And it also seems to open the door for situational awareness relative to the different operational environments. Can you speak to any of that specifically? Yeah. So when it comes to, uh, when it comes to any kind of situation where we may have to defend ourselves, and I'm looking for my notes here, uh, we basically have four options, right? And these come right out of the book that I recommended to you guys, uh, spotting danger before it spots you, uh, we have the option to avoid. And that basically comes down to situational awareness, understanding the environment we're in, being able to um, have a grasp on the baseline, know what's normal, know what's not normal, uh, understand pre-attack indicators, understand things that are outside of the baseline, listening to that voice that says, you know what, you should get the fuck out of here. Um, and just avoiding that situation entirely. Uh, mm-hmm. if you're a law enforcement officer, if you're a, and, and I mean, you don't have to worry about it if you're a law enforcement officer, I guess, but like some of us can't avoid, uh, can't avoid that situation. We have to go into it, uh, mm-hmm. or you may have to, you know, voluntarily enter into that situation. Uh, but for most of us living our lives and especially anywhere we'd be carrying in a non-permissive environment, um, you can pretty much just choose to avoid that situation. Um, and situational awareness will get you out of, I don't know, 95% of the situations mm-hmm. that you're ever going to be in. So, uh, then moving down the, down the scale, uh, the option to escape. Um, if I'm walking down the street and someone pulls a knife on me, uh, I have no moral or ethical qualms about exercising my right to, to use deadly force against the deadly force threat. Believe me, um, no, no moral issue with it at all, but I don't want to be on the six o'clock news. I don't want to have to, uh, leave it in the hands of law enforcement to decide who actually was in the right, just based on, you know, my story versus this, uh, guy over here, assuming room temperature. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't want to, you know, potentially be sued by the family. I don't like, there's a lot of negative outcomes that come from fighting. Right. And even, um, you know, even if I deliver all every single round of my gun, high center mass, still no guarantee that it stops that threat. Um, it it's there, the, any kind of confrontation I get into, there's a greater than 0% chance that I will be injured in some way. I don't want to be injured. I like the lifestyle that I live. I want to keep living it. Um, so I have no qualms about turning around and walking away, turning around and running away. If, if the, if the tactical situation permits, if I'm being shot at, I'm not going to outrun a bullet. I, I'm going to do what I got to do. Um, but there, the option for escape is always there. I don't think we talk about that a whole lot. So 95% of our stuff we can just avoid with good situational awareness, you know, a, you know, two or three more percent we can avoid by escaping. Uh, then, uh, we can potentially deescalate. Uh, and I'm not saying if somebody has a gun on you, sit there and try to talk to them. Um, although if they have a gun on you, you might have to wait your turn. Um, yeah. But a lot of situations we can we can deescalate. Um, a couple of books, the Art of Verbal Judo, 
Uh, I'm sure you've read that, Rich. That is a phenomenally good book. Um, another, just another good people skills book that I always like, never miss a chance to recommend. It's not all about me by Robin Drake. It's the art of rapid rapport building. Incredibly good book. I've read it probably 10 times. I've probably bought 10 or 15 copies for people because I think it's so good. You can read it in an hour and a half. Um, mm. And then, so deescalate, we could probably get out of like one more percent. And then we're left with that, like that one or 2% of everything uh, that we ha actually have to get into some sort of conflict with. And again, the gun is just a tool, right? I, mm. Like I am the weapon. The gun is just a tool. I've got all sorts of different tools at my disposal. Would I like to have the best possible tool? Yeah, that'd be a rifle. Um, and guess what? I'm not carrying ever a uh, rifle, right? So everything is a second best option. Everything is a is a a suboptimal option for that situation. Um, it's just how far down that that hierarchy uh, do I need to go? Um, you know, a can of pepper. So like sometimes I'll leave my gun or leave my house without my gun um, if I'm going out drinking, which I absolutely do sometimes and don't take a firearm because the legal liability inherent in that. Uh, but one thing I never leave the house with out is a can of OC spray. I've got some, uh, yeah. you know, I've got a little bit of range with this. I can, you know, it, I, I feel like pepper spray gets such a, I know you like pepper spray, Rich, oh, but I feel absolutely. like it gets a bad rap because it's always the chick weapon, right? It, it, yeah. I've used on <clears throat> dozens of people as a police officer, corrections officer, and as a bouncer, uh, it is a can of whoop ass in a can, as they used to say back in the day. But it, 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 you will see, I mean, I, on a completely side note, I think we need to reevaluate the efficacy of tasers. More often than not, the taser fails. And now, you know, you're in a, you're in a world of hurt because this guy's pissed off. I'll, I'll be honest, I, I really don't know anything about him. But yeah, I, like, I don't really have any interest in them. They're not really... It, in my wheelhouse, but and, and I don't either. When Taser were relatively new when I became a police officer, only the on shift supervisor had one, so I never really saw much of it. Never certainly have used it on anybody. I have used pepper spray. And if you're aware of it, you've taken a couple of blasts to the face in training, and you know, then you know what it's gonna do to you. So and there's ways to deploy it, but I, I tell you, pepper spray, and guess what? Even if everything goes wrong in court, even if the police is like, you are not justified in deploying that pepper spray. It's a simple assault, guys. It's a It's very legal. Assault. Yeah. Yeah. And off if, it's, if I spray you with pepper spray, guess who can see their phone to dial 911 and guess who can't? So exactly. Like, um, it's a phenomenal that. tool, man, that I recommend to, because you need an intermediate force option. The blade is not an intermediate force option. No, that's it's a deadly force. force tool. And I can have this in my hand, standing at the gas pump, standing at the urinal, walking down the sidewalk, whatever. Um, probably nobody even sees that I have anything in my hand. If they do, they probably, and looks like I got a pasty from the shooting range on the bottom of my <laughs> pepper spray can. Um, even if they do see it, they probably don't know what it is. And even if they do, Guess what? I'm not. I'm still not brandishing a weapon. There's nothing that says you can't carry pepper spray in your hand. And let's. I'll tell you another rule story. If I don't know if you've ever seen the can of pepper spray, it's a pretty pretty big can that I carried as a bouncer. And uh, of course, I'm not spraying inside the club. But if I take somebody out and they still want to fight and they've got their buddies and we're in a parking lot and it's me or maybe me and one other floorman and there's three or four dudes, I can't. We can't deal with that. I mean, let's just be honest. There's no. Bruce Lee bullshit. You're going to get your ass kicked. It's a matter of yeah. numbers at some point. So that's where pepper spray comes in. And you will find a lot of dents in my can from spraying somebody in the face and striking with it at the same time. So again, we're scaling force up and we're scaling force down and spray in the face is one thing, but if I have to strike you afterwards, cause you <laughs> put your hands on me, yeah. I'm more than capable of doing it. And the can is more than capable of taking that hit. So Again, uh, let's look at some comments here, Justin. Will says, my gun yep. has never had to find its way into my hand in public. However, OC has. Tony says, just because you can stand your ground doesn't mean you should. Well said. Uh, Gerald says, unfortunately, you have to go to stupid places with stupid people. Sometimes you do, man. In yeah. case in point, I wasn't sure I was going to tell this, but I will. I was recently in a city where the governor of that city had made it uh, illegal to carry in that city. She has essentially chosen to violate the second amendment rights of all the people that live in that city. However, the, the police in that city have said, yeah, I don't care what she says. We're not violating any of our citizens rights. So do as you wish. And I did, I violated the governor's order carrying in that city. And 
and uh, because of the calculus. And this is a very dangerous city. It's it's a dangerous city. That's the reason why she said nobody can carry a gun there. Surprise, the criminals ain't going to play by her rule. Just because, oh, the governor said I can't. Oh, right. well, shit, we better put our guns up. <laughs> um, and I did have to cross. There's a place in that, that city that's really violent. And because my son works on the other side and lives on the other side, we have to travel through that area. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> Having said all that, it, it's it's that calculus you do before you go. Now, does that mean that I might need to dress differently to really conceal my tools? You know what I'm saying? Right. Most of the time, most of the time, I'm in exactly what you see me in a t-shirt and a and a pair of khakis with my, you know, my gun under the t-shirt. And am am I concealed? Yes, um, I I do believe in concealed carry. I, I'm not a open carrier. Um, would I trust this in a, <laughs> this get up in a situation where I might go to jail? I might be, you know, lose my right to carry a gun going forward. I might lose my job. No, this is not doing the trick. I, I'm going to have to, and let's talk about that. It's a great segue, Rich, of sometimes you do make that decision. Sometimes the calculus is there of, okay, um, I understand the rule. I understand the consequences for breaking it. And I'm, uh, I've decided to go ahead and to go ahead with this, the risk and the benefit make it worth it to me to, and, and I'm going to take steps to mitigate uh, being caught violating the rule, but uh, it's worth it to me. Sometimes that has to be done. So um, I don't know. You want to talk about that just a little bit yeah. of, of once you have decided to commit. Recently, me and my wife had a really heated debate and I didn't intend for it to get out of <laughs> go heated, but uh, there was a sign at the airport says, don't push this door. It's an emergency exit door. Don't push it. Violators will receive a $1,500 fine. And I looked at the door and I'm like, I got 1500 bucks laying around. Why don't I just push this damn door open? <laughs> He's just like, why would you? I'm like, well, the, you've already determined the stakes of this game. The stakes right. of the game are $1,500. If I'm a millionaire, I'll just sit here. Eh, 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 eh. Here's another $1,500. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Won't do it again. Eh, yeah. eh, eh. I say that because let's say that, um, that if you if if the your job where you said you would never carry out your job, but let's say the state in which you work said, okay, if we catch a level X paramedic carrying uh, on an ambulance or on the job, the fine will be fifty dollars. Would you yeah, carry I'll, at work? Yes, absolutely. See what I'm saying? So yeah, that's part yeah, the, of that calculus. The, the moral hazard, yeah. uh, like they, they they've designed decided what the moral hazard is for that action. And you said this, this is, this is directly from Rich Brown. Um, fines are, what is it? Fines are, uh, admission fees Cost to do, pay to you do what you want. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> and I believe that, you know, so again, but, but, that, and they know that I think smart jurisdictions know that. that's why the UK has put 10 years. You're going to do yeah. day for day, 10 years. If we catch you with pepper spray, Whoa, I'm not carrying anything that even That's, looks like that, pepper spray, yeah, that right? Is crazy. Yeah. If if they did a uh it's gonna be 10 hours of community service. If you we catch you with pepper spray, I'd probably carry a pepper spray. I'm like, I'll do 10, 10 hours of community <laughs> service, polishing right. brass at the Queens and Buckingham right. Palace. <laughs> Waving everybody, which uh, yeah, that's that's a whole different like pepper, like you're gonna completely take away someone's ability to defend themselves with a super lethal <laughs> lethal option. It, Kind of boggles the mind a little bit, but it does boggle the mind. Uh, Rasmic is on gold never says greetings. Everyone just can't find time to set and enjoy the show working with shiny objects. Rasmic is a jeweler. I hope you're having a great day out there. I believe you're nice. in California. Rasmic. Hope you're doing well. Uh, so a moment ago, you mentioned the bad acronym and you just kind of breeze past it. And for those that probably are, or maybe are new to the show, let's talk about that just briefly. So the bad acronym relative to situational awareness, as I understand it comes from, um, uh, uh, Brian Williams, uh, of Arcadia Cognorati, who kind of created the tools that later became adopted by the Marine Corps as the combat hunter program. I've had Greg on the show many times and Brian of Arcadia Cognorati there. Please check out the shows I did with them, but bad stands for baseline plus anomaly equals a decision. It's a very simple equation. You have a cultural baseline. Okay. We all know, you know, Justin and I are from Southern Appalachia. He's on one side of the mountain. I'm on another. 
And so we understand this cultural context. It, like when I was in Santa Fe, it's got a little bit different vibe, but it's still in America. The cultural baseline is still pretty much the same. But when I start picking up anomalous behavior, one, two, three, I've got a cluster of three things that are kind of anomalous for this cultural context. I have to make a decision. What am I going to do? Am I going to continue with what I'm doing? Am I going to change my course? Am I going to back out, make a tactical retreat or retrograde? Uh, but yeah, uh, the BAD acronym is a great device to teach your kids about. And you could say, like, what is the cultural context of, of uh, the TV a and fair in Knoxville, Tennessee? Well, there's cotton candy. There's a pony ride. Yeah, okay, cool. What else? Uh, there's a Ferris wheel. Uh, how about uh, a clown holding a bloody machete? Is that appropriate for here? No, probably not. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, you and I talked about this on our, I'm Googling it right now, uh, or looking it up right now, our situational awareness episode of across the peak. We talked about, um, pre-attack indicators, uh, things like the witness mm -hmm. glance or, right. um, someone Tar who's putting a in the shooting. Yeah. The target, well, targeted glance, witness glancing, uh, like looking around mm -hmm. to make sure no one's there. Mm -hmm. Um, either, uh, like someone who's, uh, and I forget all the distinct terminology on this stuff, like hyper fixated on one thing or like walking with a distinct purpose toward, uh, towards something wearing clothing that's outside of the, you know, the environmental baseline. Yeah. Um, yeah. Panting. Um, Unnatural. Uh, you know, so like I hands in my pockets, there's nothing unusual about that. If you hang around me for more than five minutes, you'll see me with my hands in my pockets, but an unnatural concealment of the hands. Yeah. Okay, the, what, what the hell is he doing there? He's not scratching. It's just kind of resting there. Oh, really? Uh, what the hell? So, again, you put those clusters together. Unnatural concealment of the hands. I'm glancing around, mouth breathing, and now I'm I'm hyper fixating on you. Now, now, you're, co now you're coming up to ask me the time. Like, yeah, that's a cluster of yeah cluster of things. Um, uh I, for, I just lost my train of thought on what I was going to say with that, but I did those, talk about uh, the tactical retrograde. I don't know if that's a good segue or not for you, Justin. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. You know, uh, in, in that, whether it's an active shooter, like we saw in Moscow, closed toed shoes, if you're going to escape, if you've, you've, you couldn't avoid the problem, you put yourself in that situation, your calculus turned out wrong and it's time to roll. Talk to me about that. <sighs> I don't know. I don't know where you're going. I don't know where you're, I know you're lobbing me a softball, Rich, but I'm, I'm whiffing it. <laughs> well, I, I guess my point is as we consider a non-permissive environment and as we're moving through these arm, because here's another interesting distinction. Like my, my son works on a, a military base. Okay. So even though we're going to, we want to spend our day touring this, town in new mexico at some point we're going to go on the base that's the plan for the day i can't even have a gun in the car you see what i'm saying All right yeah. so th there's no hard and fast this is a very fluid environment so we have to make our calculus of okay we're gonna hang out in this part of town come back by your house drop the gun and then we're gonna go on base and then we're gonna come back pick up the gun and continue on or are we gonna try to sneak the gun and hide it in a compartment and risk going to prison federal prison i mean uh, it's, well, it's also, not hard also, and fast, you know, also back to like the level of concealment that you choose on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, depending on where you live, that may be a much bigger concern for you than not. When I lived and worked up in Northern Virginia, um, one single bridge being out could mean I have to cross over into the district, which makes my completely legal firearm choices. The fact that I'm carrying a firearm, whatever, uh, now is a felony. Um, but just by virtue of the fact that that I crossed an imaginary line and had to go into the district, uh, which, um, you know, I, I would <laughs> just for many reasons, try to avoid as best as I possibly could. Uh, but should that happen, I like, I never wanted to catch myself, you know, wearing a, you know, a, like my 1911 under just a t-shirt. Like I always, I always took a little bit more pains to be concealed there just in case something should happen and I should, you know, find myself somewhere I didn't want to be. Yeah, you could be as well intentioned as you want, you know, and like you're you're saying there, the bridge is out, and all of a sudden, oh shit, I'm being diverted through DC, and and I know this is illegal, but what am I supposed to do, right? I'm I'm really yeah. caught. Uh, another case in point is you're I'm flying from here to Maine, 
And for whatever reason, the plane gets diverted in New York City. You and I have talked about this before. Now, all of a sudden, okay, I'm landed. I'm going to collect my bag, which is going to have a firearm in it. No harm, no foul. But then they say, hey, we're going to put you up at a hotel for the night. Make sure you be back here tomorrow morning for your flight out at eight. Now I'm checking a bag that has a gun in it. And right. now the, the flashing <laughs> lights are going to go off. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to go to jail and get arrested in New York City. Well, what were what were my options? So, right. uh, and people that, that live on, uh, for example, we have a lot of members in South Africa. The South African members that carry a gun can't imagine the wackiness of our firearms laws here in the United States. So like, but you guys have the Second Amendment. And you got your card. I'm like, it doesn't matter. Every damn ju jurisdiction <laughs> has some sort yeah. of unconstitutional law we have to play by. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You and I have talked about this before. I wish there was one permit. Like, tell me what hoop I got to jump through, what background checked, what qual I got to shoot, whatever, to just give me the, like, you can go anywhere you want. You're good. Yeah. Um, but so, so back to the, uh, back to the NPE thing, uh, kind of bringing this back around. So if you do choose to, to carry in a true non permissive environment, and I don't mean, uh, you know, some of the stuff you find on YouTube videos when you, when you search NPE carry, but a true non-permissive environment where there are life altering stakes, uh, concealment is a very, very high priority at the expense of a little bit of accessibility. So, um, I've not worked with it, but the Filster Enigma, have you worked with that thing, Rich? I've never cared about it, the people that, I, my friends that have carried it rave about it. So that thing, uh, apparently has a huge following with doctors and nurses that carry because it's very easy to wear under scrubs. Um, you know, you're not going to be carrying a Glock 17 or a, you know, M and P competition, whatever, uh, in that thing. But, uh, you can, you can probably carry a, you know, Glock 43 or a SIG P365. It's pretty decent firepower, um, with that thing under, you know, under scrubs. Uh, you also got to consider, uh, kind of your, what is the environment you're going into? Um, I think I mentioned it last time, Rich, but the, uh, the Claude Werner, the, uh, what do you call it? The Home Depot test or whatever. Yeah. Tell um, tell us about that. We should have talked about that earlier. <clears throat> yeah. So what's the name of that? Um, the Claude Werner test. He basically said, if you want to think about NPE, uh, go get yourself a job at a Lowe's for a month. Uh, you got to, you know, stretch up to high shelves to get stuff off the shelf. You're bending down to get stuff off other shelves. If anyone sees that gun, you're fired and you just lost your, you just, you got to go home and tell your wife you lost your income and you're going to have to, you know, eating peanut butter sandwiches until you find a new job. Um, do that for a month and, or, you know, imagine doing yourself doing that for a month. And, and that's how you should be thinking about a, you know, quote unquote NPE gun is to pass that Claude Werner test. Kind of the same thing here, right? If you're a doctor uh, or a nurse, you may be going in for a 12 hour shift and I, I don't know why I'm pulling those out, whatever it is, you may be going in for a set period of time. You may have to perform all sorts of physical actions. You may be in con like physical contact with other people who may feel that gun. You may be, um, you may cross a point of no return, right? Where once you're in that building, there is no going back out to your car and ditching that gun. There's no, like you're stuck with it for the duration until you get off and they let you go home at the end of the day, whatever the case may be. So concealment, um, is a, is a, is a bigger priority than accessibility. Uh, we also probably scale down what we actually carry. Uh, and then you and I talked about this rich, but, uh, my personal philosophy would be, and, and again, I, you can, you can come surprise me on my ambulance and pat me down. I don't carry at work. Uh, but my philosophy is, uh, is if you do, uh, nobody knows, uh, that is between you and, and yourself. And that is it. Um, I, <laughs> uh, I told rich an anecdote, um, about a facility that I worked on one time where someone thought I had a gun and it turned into a huge issue and whatever. Uh, and I don't mean like had a gun on me, just rumor that one was in my car and it turned into a, like no one should know it is, that is a private piece of information, a, priv a very privileged piece of information. And again, look at the stakes, man. Do you trust, you know, your buddy that you, you bowl with every Tuesday night to, you know, with this information that could put, you know, put you in prison for 10 years, take away your right to carry a gun deprive your family of the income that you're going to earn, take away your job. I don't, I don't trust anybody uh, with that information. So that's a, that's a, that's a great one. I'm so glad you brought that up <clears throat> for one. There's the Claude Warner thing. And I think that Claude come up with this and I don't speak for him, but uh, the way I kind of understand it is there's so many firearms instructors and gun commandos in our community that you should carry a gun all the time, everywhere, blah, blah, blah. Okay. That's not realistic, man. 
That's just not real. Some people, like you right. said, we have, we have a lot of physicians who are American Warrior Society members. I've talked to a lot of them, whether at Warrior Camp or other places. And, you know, and some of them do carry under their scrubs and some of them carry in the ankle carry and some of them don't, you know, they're like, it's just too much of a risk. Um, and if you want to go that route, then, then take the, t you know, try it. And you're going to learn a lot about what will and will not work in that environment. But also let's suppose for a second that you do have to use that firearm. Uh, and there's a case in point where there was a FFDO federal flat deck officer, who's a armed commercial airline pilot. <clears throat> and I think he was at Miami or Fort Lauderdale. There was a shooting. Somebody retrieved their bag, got out of gun and started shooting. Well, this FFDO who's sitting there as a commercial airline pilot, having lunch, he hears the gunfire pulls his G 40 cal or whatever, and goes running down there. The uh, po police officers in the airport had already taken care of the shooter. He secures the firearm, goes back to work. But the camera, the eye in the sky, saw the security camera inside the airport, <laughs> saw him running with his firearm out and fired his ass. What? Even though he didn't employ it, but he still lost his job, his career, making a lot of money as a commercial airline pilot was lost forever. Right. And, and, and I, you know, I kind of have a philosophy on that. Uh, my... It, and easier said than done, right? I'm a high responder type person. I, you know, I, and, and now I literally am a, a paid responder. Um, it's kind of in my nature to don't, don't show me a problem you don't want me to fix. Um, but when it comes to employing deadly force, there is so much that can go wrong. Um, if it, if it doesn't concern me or mine and it's not a very clear cut, um, you know, it, active shooter that's maybe a little different or whatever and mm -hmm. you know i'm single i'm not leaving a family behind like i'm i'm willing to engage in a little bit of gunplay to save a whole bunch of other people and i realize it might go badly for me and the police might come in and shoot me in the back of the head because i'm a dude with a gun right that's right. all part of my calculus but um you know in the i'm not gonna stop and intervene on some domestic or you know i'll, I'll call the cops be a good witness whatever but um like if most things, uh, unless it's me or mine, I probably just don't need to get involved with it or I need to call professionals and let them handle it. Yeah. And that's another thing. I want to go back to something else you said also that in that, that nobody needs to know that you're carrying. Uh, for example, you know, I've been married to my wife for 36 years. If I'm carrying, she doesn't even know. So and the reason I say that is I don't want her over there mouth breathing and freaked out if she's afraid that he might get stopped and she's sure, looking at right. me and, and being freaked out. No, she's not going to know. She can't be held responsible. She help, can't be held accountable. She's going to seem just as calm and relaxed as we're moving into this event. And she doesn't need to know it. A lot of times it's after the fact we get home. And I, I put the gun in the safe. She's like, you were carrying today? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but, but. But you were supposed to like, and, and I'm like, hey, it's a semi-permissive environment, babe. I'm going right. to do what I want to do. <laughs> um, I also wanted to touch briefly on, you know, you talked about, we talked about less lethal, uh, just a little bit about pepper spray, but also empty hands. Like you said, I'm never truly unarmed. And right. like the Sixth Circuit Court determined when it was relative to Michael Brown, like just because he was unarmed doesn't mean he's harmless. Right. Uh, that's like the, the final finding on page 80 of the DOJ's report on the Michael Brown shooting, just cause he's unarmed doesn't mean he's harmless. Um, but there's a lot of things that you can do just simple things. If you are in that environment, you know, keep your hands up, elbows locked in tight, move left to right to open up your field of vision. I mean, there's a whole lot of little steps that you can do long before you need to introduce the gun or some sort of less, less lethal tool or break into headlong flight. Um, and if, if you want to find out more about that, check out the show I did today with Cecil Birch. We talked a lot about managing unknown contacts with people that you meet on the street. How do you interact with them? Because this idea, the fallacy of, I'm not going to let anybody inside my bubble. Sure you are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Give me a break. Right. We all do. You're standing in line at a grocery store. You're not shoving the low ladies and maintain a six foot reactionary gap. Uh, <laughs> it's ridiculous. So. How do you uh, be inside those environments with or without a firearm, with, regardless of what kind of NPE you're in? Uh, so one, um, situational awareness, know what's going on around you. And like you said, you know, I've heard, I've heard that same example from Cecil before of, uh, and from uh, Craig Douglas of, yeah, people will absolutely get inside whatever, you know, 
whatever distance you set, somebody's going to violate it and you're going to let them. Um, being aware of what's going on, be like being aware that person's there. Uh, Walt uh, and I, Walt and I were at a, uh, he attended a class I attended. We stopped at a gas station before he uh, hit town and he's like, yeah, or before he hit the road. And he's like, yeah, man, I, I really noticed. Uh, and I didn't I, like, I'm more aware of this now that he pointed out, but he's like, you kind of, you know, just made quick eye contact with pretty much everybody that walked by. You were kind of, you know, head on a swivel, whatever, looking around the room. And to me, it's just kind of second nature uh, at this point that that was really validating. Uh, but, but know what's going on. And also, um, you know, just that quick eye contact, like, Hey, I'm here. You're here. Uh, you know, I know you're here. Like we, there's no misunderstandings. Right. Um, yeah. I would say, don't be an asshole. Like be, be nice. Mm. Um, man, be nice goes so far, um, every single day, um, uh, just by virtue of, of being nice. You don't know how many fights you actually avoid. Right. Um, verbal judo has these five little, uh, these five little precepts and principles that I love all people from all cultures want to be treated with dignity and respect. All people would rather be asked than told what to do. All people, uh, want to know why they're asked or told to do something. All people would, uh, rather be given an option, uh, to do, you know, one of two things rather than be threatened. Uh, and all people want a second chance to make matters right. Uh, if you haven't read that book, it is a phenomenally good book, but, uh, just be nice to people be like, um, man, that goes so far. Uh, and I think you and I talked about doing a show about this sometime. I yeah. think it was so far in my practice of know how to talk to people, right? Mm -hmm. um, man, it, it, and some people you got to be really firm with. Some people are like, you really need to you know, take the soft approach with, you know, to, to get the results you want. And it's kind of reading that situation and knowing, um, you know, and this doesn't even get into de-escalation. This is all the way back at avoidance, right? Just being nice is part of your avoidance strategy. Uh, what else, Rich? Well, I mean, it's everything, you know, uh, in the context of I smile a lot and I think a smile can be disarming. Yeah. You know, my, my mouth can be going, yeah, go fuck yourself. But I'm, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, uh, or it can be, you know, another thing as a cop, it was ask, tell, make, right? ATM. I'm going to ask you one time, I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to make you do it. Well, as a civilian who carries arm armed, I can't do the make part, but I can ask. And I'm going to tell you and then move. And that means I'm going to probably move because yeah. if you're not doing it, like, if, Hey man, can you get out of my way, brother? I'm trying to get through here, man. They don't move. Right. Let's say they got me kind of boxed in here. Then it's going to be need you to move. And if yeah. they don't, then I'm going to move. Okay. No problem. I'm either move them or I'm going to move myself. And more often than not, I'm 99% of the time I'm going to move because yeah. there's there's nothing worse button heads with some, you know, monkey in a parking lot. So, um, a lot of the things you talked about with verbal judo, it should be common sense, but it is not. And I talked about on today's show, I won't belabor it again for those that are watching to uh, Justin and I, but had an incident recently with an employee, uh, another company, a construction company that I run that you know about Justin. <clears throat> and, uh, he got into it with somebody at a gas station parking lot and I kind of had to help him go over it in his head. Like this is a set of circumstances. This is what happened. Was this a favorable outcome for you? Well, no. Okay. What could we have done differently? Because it's not common sense. It sounds like treating people with respect would be a no brainer, but I don't know what it is, man. It seems to be slipping. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure you've told me about that situation uh, or another one similar to it. And also there's, um, you know, some people just have no self-awareness, no mm -hmm. um, emotional intelligence, no ability to read the room and understand yeah. like mm -hmm. uh, if you, if you come at me like this, you're not going to get the result you think you're going to get. You, like, um, I, I, I don't know. People would much rather be asked. Yeah. And, and again, told, like, yeah. These little things like, um, like I did a second ago, uh, Hey brother, need to get through here real quick. And my grandfather was real good about that. He, he was a very gregarious, likable, charismatic person. And he had called people, Hey captain, you know, Hey darling. <laughs> you know, he was just this really large than life character oh, that everybody wanted to be around. And I kind of learned a lot of that. And he said, yeah, during the, the depression, they called me smiling Ralph Brown. I just went to, <laughs> how much is that bushel of peaches? 
all right, Captain, thank you. And keep moving. You know, <laughs> uh, yeah. But and the, and you know, in 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 my in my job, it's almost a character I put on. Of, yes. Hey, darling, what's going on today? What what in the world are you doing laying down there? You know, like it's it's a it's a very much a a practice affect. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's not always the same, right? It's it, it, yes. if I go into a house with an elevator in it, a house, you know, so big, it has its own elevator. I'm going to act very differently than I'm, if I'm in Meemaw's house that she's lived in, you know, her two bedroom ranch house that she's lived in and raised 18 kids in since 1910. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm, and, and I also work with people who don't understand those distinctions yes. and who, <laughs> have the same dumbass comments for everybody. And it's like, yeah, this might've played over there, but it's, I don't, I don't know what you're doing over here. Cause it's just, let me handle this one. Exactly. Um, but it's not one size to, fits all, man. It's yeah, culturally yeah, specific. It's yeah. regional specific. It's dialect dependent. I mean, you put on a different voice when you were talking to me, Ma, a second ago. Uh, and and you know, yeah. And you know, some people want to be told, um, yeah, so uh, you, it looks like you have a, con, a conduction problem in your sinoatrial node that is causing you to have a slightly lengthened, what we call a PR interval. It's the interval between when your atria fires and your ventricle contracts. Uh, some people want to be told that, and some people like, well, darling, it just looks like you got a funny heartbeat. Some people live with it their whole lives, and it ain't no big deal, but we probably ought to go get it checked out anyway. Like, it's, you know, it's just kind of understanding what, like being able to size that person up. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a practice skill and that's a huge, you know, I think you and I have talked about if I could go back and redo things, I think recruiting duty probably would have been a be one of the best things that ever happened to me for that reason. You're forced to talk to people. You're forced to make those judgments about people based on all these context clues, the car they're driving, the clothes they're wearing, the, mm -hmm. you know, how they smell, how they look, how they, you know, how they carry themselves. Um, and that's a tremendous thing I get out of this is I'm, I'm, in contact with that every single shift of having to make those like trying to have the best possible rapport I can have with everybody I meet, um, you know, including, you know, firemen and cops and everybody else, not mm -hmm. just the patients, but yeah. Um, and I don't know what the answer to that is if you don't work in, in some sort of field that puts you in contact with a broad spectrum of people, but man, that is invaluable. It is totally invaluable. You mentioned Walt earlier, just so we're clear. Walt Sotomayor is a good friend of ours. He uh, he has the Distinguished Savage podcast. Uh, give him a listen over there. I'm sure he would appreciate yeah, it. I want to get to a couple of comments here. Uh, Will Parker said, I learned this from one of my mentors and friends, be non-reactive. And if you're looking at somebody that's extremely confident, there's like, there's something about this guy. Chances are he's going to be non-reactive. He or her, I guess. It doesn't need to be gender specific. <clears throat> but nothing there's nothing that says you have to say something or do something right now you know you can be just right. let the pause linger you don't have to stumble <laughs> over a, and a uh, lot of times that'll um, take a that'll you know that'll if somebody's looking for a reaction right away uh mm -hmm. just being non-reactive will kind of diffuse <laughs> you know kind of well, take the wind the, out of the shells there's something in jujitsu and judo called kazushi and it's the ter it's an idea of off balancing but it doesn't just have to be in, in the context of I'm going to grab your lapel and pull you in and do a foot sweep. Now I did a Kazushi on you. It, it can be also that they're, they're looking for that reaction in a parking lot and you're just being non-reactive. Right. Or, um, man, I rich, where did I hear this? Uh, or just saying something completely out of the blue, like, Hey, you looking at my girlfriend? Uh, no, actually, uh, I was just wondering, maybe, you know, how tall are the fences in Spain? Like, <laughs> what what um and that that actually works i i throw some off the wall questions at people yeah, yeah, it, it goes to chuck's point though chuck says you don't need to attend every argument you're invited to man that is a great comment too yeah, yeah i know we should steal that thank you chuck uh gerald says common courtesy is not very common anymore no and it's mm -mm. it seems to be getting uh less and less common uh, will parker says be polite be professional but have a plan i love that uh, Justin, I'll keep you on here about an hour and 20 minutes. Any closing thoughts as, r r relative to non-permissive environments? Not really. Uh, if you're, if you're, you know, make your, make a valid assessment of your actual risk of the benefit you get out of that risk. Like, you, you know, if you got to bury some derringer so deep that you're not even going to be able to get it out and it's not going to do you much good anyway. Um, and then 
you know, like be willing to, uh, I guess ultimately be willing to accept the consequences of, you know, whatever action you, you decide to take. Yeah. And Razwick says, I like playing possum solves lots of problems, lots of punks in Sacramento, California. Can't fight ever. No, you can't. And nor should you no. uh, live the fight another day. I have, and, and that's another point. I'm not in, I have never taught anyone how to fight anybody. Let's think about that real quick. And I talk about this in the introduction of my book. A fight has a referee. It has time limits. It has pads. It has all the safety equipment. It's agreed upon rules by both parties. That's not what this show's about or anything relative to the American warrior show in our 10 year history. It is not what we do. Even though I say the fight's coming, what I should probably say is the, uh, the uh, aggravated assault is coming. Be ready. I mean, right. because really what we're talking about is a counter counter assault or a counter ambush. Uh, so uh, I want to be very kind of clear every now and then we need to let words have meaning, right, man. So I probably should say that I'm not saying fight anybody. What I'm saying is, is awareness and avoided situational awareness, non-permissive environments. Like Justin said, think about the calculus. Are you going to be able to carry? Are you not? Should you, should you not? What are the rules of engagement? We have ROE here, just like they have overseas. And our ROE is clearly codified in the law of self-defense. Go check out Andrew Brock's book, five elements. If you don't know them, you could be spending the rest of your life in prison. Um, so there's a lot that goes into this. Self-defense is a truly a thinking man's game. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. Justin, if somebody wanted to follow you, what would they need to do? Uh, just navigate your browser to swiftsilentdeadly.com. Uh, that's pretty much it. Very simple. I love that. Man, a few words. Uh, Justin and I were going to do a BSOC course. Uh, we still have that planned. We had a real significant problem with the venue. The owner of the venue kind of doubled the price and then he quadrupled the price. And I don't know if that had something to do with the fact that he found that we were going to have firearms in his facility. I don't know what happened, but uh, you want to talk to him real quick about BSOC course. And if they would like to attend that course, maybe where they should drop an email at. Yeah. Black side operators course. Uh, so we have a, uh, very cool curriculum planned out. Unfortunately. Yeah. Like Rich said, unfortunately the venue, uh, no longer supports it. Um, but some firearm stuff, some basically everything you need to survive, uh, anything from a gritty street fight to a, uh, you know, a fancy cocktail party. Uh, it'll also be kind of fun. So, uh, yeah. we've got some, you know, some of those verbal human elements built in there, uh, some firearm stuff, some trauma stuff, some a little bit of everything. Yeah. Social engineering to unarmed combatives to non-destructive breaching, a lot of really cool stuff, everything you're going to need to keep you safe in an urban environment. That's the kind of the, yeah. the idea with the black side. And then of course we may at some point do a green side operator course. We'll, we'll, we'll just have to see about that. The G suck. Yeah. But if you've joined to, if you've enjoyed today's show, please give us a review on iTunes. We would really appreciate that Spotify or anywhere you find your podcast. And if you want to go and tiptoe through the tulips with Justin and I a little bit longer, go back and check out some previous episodes we did of across the peak. Uh, we really had a lot of fun with that. Yeah, and with that I being said, that. Justin, you want to take us out? brother? Yeah. Um, what is your thing? Uh, the, fight. the fight's coming. Be ready. Yeah. There you go. Thanks, yeah, I, was, I almost did the, I almost did the can't be safe, be dangerous. Uh, yeah. <laughs> fight's coming. Be ready. Hey, that'll work too. Bye.